Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Sorry I missed the class. Um, on Thursday, I was sitting at my desk and just kind of wasn't looking at the time. But anyway, y'all got some pretty good questions, so we're going to get them answered. Um, one of the first one, I guess the first one is, can you discuss the difference in 3D mammogram versus MRI for screening patients with dense breast tissue? Excuse me, 3D mammogram. So mammogram versus 3D mammogram. It's really a scam, sort of. If you take a regular mammogram, you get your MLO and your craniocaudal views. Every once in a while, what will happen is they'll come back and say, hey, we need to do additional films because we couldn't see one area that well. So they'll come in and do ones where they kind of zoom in and spot check this or turn your left or right. Now, 3D mammography, what they do with tomosynthesis, they actually don't take the regular craniocaudal and medial lateral view. They take kind of a 30 or 30 degree angle on one side, 30 degree angle on the other side. And then once they're done with that, they put it in a computer and it generates a 3D image of that breast. Now that sounds fantastic. It's a great idea. But if you look at regular mammogram versus a 3D mammogram, you actually only pick up one in a thousand extra cancers. So it's probably more of a sales gimmick than anything. If you think about it, one in a thousand, it's not really good odds. So saying that we're going to buy all these brand new machines to pick up one in a thousand cancers, that realistically, given six months, you wait, repeat a mammogram, you're probably going to catch anyway, and you're not changing the stage, probably not reasonable. Now, the problem with a dense breast and a mammogram is everything's clouded out. So what happens is you can't see behind the mass or around the mass, you just see dense breast tissue. So in that case, you need something more, and that's where we go to MRI. So MRI is a nice modality as well. It is going to pick up seven out of 1,000 additional cancers. Now, that sounds good, but Think about it as you can't just do a regular MRI, you have to have a breast MRI coil. Um, you then can't do everybody because what happens with a mammogram with an MRI if you do it just on everybody? Yes, you're not getting radiation, but the trick is, is that you are um, increasing the expense of it. You're having to give um, a tracer that is expensive. Um, you have anaphylaxis to that tracer sometimes. People have um, die allergies and everything you don't know about. But the biggest thing is you pick up everything. You pick up a clogged duct. You pick up papillomas. You pick up things that aren't normally seen on a mammogram. So now we're getting more information than we need and probably more than we know what to do with. So then you add in everything that you find you're going to biopsy. So because of that, you end up biopsying a whole a lot of women that are doing unnecessary tests. Now, are you biopsying women <coughs> and picking up cancers that you normally wouldn't pick up? Or are you doing unnecessary tests and then those women in six months would develop abnormal mammograms and then you would say, okay, um, now we see them. So that, again, adding more information is not always the right answer. So I hope that answers your question. If, in my practice, what I usually do is always stick with the 3D mammogram unless they have really dense breast tissue, a history of breast cancer, or um, the, radi the medical oncologist wants one. Hope that what is the difference between screening and diagnostic mammogram? Okay, so screening mammogram versus diagnostic is it, it's kind of an insurance thing. Woman comes in, she's never had a mammogram, she needs a screening mammogram, simple. You get a screening mammogram every year. Now, let's say you walk into my office and I feel a lump in your breast, specifically young women, so women that are 20 to 35, 20 to 40, that I would otherwise do a mammogram with, and I want to get a picture or a mammogram of the mass before I biopsy it. In that situation, you have to get a screening mammogram first before you can get a diagnostic mammogram. So a diagnostic mammogram is what it says. You are you have pathology, 
and you want to look specifically at that. The problem is, is that insurance companies, for the most part, won't let you get a diagnostic mammogram if you haven't had a screening mammogram. So if you get an ultrasound on a young woman, she has a fibroadenoma, before you can get a diagnostic mammogram, you have to get a screening mammogram. Now, most of the radiologists kind of just say, oh, okay, cool, I got you. And then they end up doing them all at the same time. So they'll do one image, screening, got it, bill for it, diagnostic, two or three images, yes, BIRADS 4 or BIRADS 2, move on. Um, so that's the difference. You just Your screening is always your first mammogram. Now, if someone comes in and has a full-blown breast cancer, looks like inflammatory, everything, and they haven't had a mammogram before because it was just diagnosed clinically, same thing. They have to have a screening mammogram, then a diagnostic. Um, another way to look at it is a screening mammogram is usually bilateral versus diagnostic is usually unilateral. So that's how the radiologists and the insurance companies tell the difference. Number three, clarification on mammogram screening and diagnosis for under 50, over 50. Guidelines and clinical practice. Ooh, that's a big one. Okay, so the true standard recommendation that CMS or Medicare, Medicaid follow is a screening mammogram at the age of 50. Prior to that, self breast examinations and or a examination by a clinician every year. Okay. Before 50, the recommendation is if you find a abnormality or some type of pathology on physical exam, then you can do a screening mammogram one to two every one to two years. So that is the official recommendation. Now, what most gynecologists do and family practice doctors do is at the age of 40, they start getting a mammogram. Some of the older ones get them once a year, starting at age 40. Some will push it as, up, as far up as 35. Some of the younger physicians will now start doing mammograms at 40, one to two years depending on how the patient feels. So if they are want a mammogram every year, that's fine. If they want one every one to two years or one every two years, that's fine as well. There are very few people out there starting their first mammograms at age 35. But again, that's based on the fact that cancers before the age of 50 are usually found on physical exam. Now, those guidelines change every couple of months, actually. Um, for a while, they went away with self-breast examination, but then they were trying to push more mammograms. And then now we've gone back to more clinical physical exam, followed by self-breast egg, self -breast examination as an augmentation. Also remember that this is based on the fact that in the 80s, we weren't doing any of this, and now we're doing everything, and we've had almost a 40% reduction in breast cancer deaths. So that's why everyone's eager to do screening, but we found ourselves doing too much screening. Hope that clarifies the question. Number four is how can the mammotone be used to diagnose and treat breast cancer? Okay, so a mammotone is basically a small, think of it as a small scalpel with a spiral in it, so it can go in and grab out tissue. So you can see something abnormal on mammogram, go in with the mammotone, take it out, and you're done. If that comes back as fibrocystic disease, nothing else to do, it's a fibroadenoma, you can decide whether you want to go back in with the mammotone and take bigger pieces of it and remove it. So that's how you can use it to treat fibroadenomas. With breast cancers, if you have a small area or a small foci of breast cancer, you could technically treat it with a mammotone. The problem with that is you're going to have a hard time establishing margins. Most people, what they would do is put a clip in and go back and do a local excision. 
but there are people out there that are using the mammotone to excise very small, tiny, early breast cancers. I wouldn't do it. Number five, can you please review the indications for sentinel lymph node biopsy? Okay, so we'll go with DCIS. DCIS, if you have a diagnosis of high-grade DCIS, palpable DCIS, the current recommendation is to consider sentinel lymph node biopsy. Mid-grade DCIS, the recommendation you can do it or don't do it. Low-grade, you don't. Understand that, again, this is based on the fact that if you have high-grade DCIS, there is a piece, there is a small chance that there may be a cancer underlying. If you have palpable DCIS, there is a chance that you may have a cancer underlying the mass or the tumor. So in that situation, they recommend doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy because if you do a mastectomy for DCIS, and again, high grade, you are recommended to do a, a mastectomy at this time, palpable, not so much. But with high grade DCIS, because they recommend doing a total mastectomy, if you do a total mastectomy, you remove a mass in a woman's breast. I mean, you remove the breast, you no longer have the nipple or the cancer to be able to inject with methylene blue or radioisotope to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, so you commit those patients to an axillary node dissection. Now, an axillary node dissection done in the right hands is not really a bad thing. If you are someone and is trying to take all the lymph nodes out and you haven't been trained to do it and don't realize you need to take at least 10 different issues, then you're gonna have a high rate of lymphedema. Breast cancer, because it's breast cancer, sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, it used to be we would do a lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy versus a modified radical mastectomy, which is a total mastectomy with an axillary node dissection. The data came out that realistically you can do an effective total mastectomy and then turn around and do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And if that is positive, then do an axillary node dissection. Hope that clarifies. Number six is the FNA diagnostic or therapeutic or solely to alleviate pain? And the lecture states that surgery is rare for this disorder. Would you only do surgery if DCIS is present or are there other indications? I'm going to try and twist that question a little bit to, to answer it because I kind of get what you're thinking, sort of. Um, Fibrocystic disease is traditionally found because you have an abnormal mammogram. So you usually are not doing a, you're not doing a lumpectomy, you're definitely not doing a mastectomy for fibrocystic disease because it's not cancer. Now, if you had someone who says, I'm in severe pain, severe pain, severe pain, my breast hurt all the time, you could get away with doing it, but it is not standard of care. Fibrocystic disease is diagnosed on an abnormality, found on mammogram, or palpable mass biopsy, okay? So you're not really treating it. You're really just telling them that's what it is. Now, lecture stage surgery is rare for disorder, again, because we don't really cut out entire breasts for benign disease, that's why. Would you only do surgery if DCIS is present so again, DCIS is different. DCIS has been moved from a precancerous lesion to a, a low-grade cancer, more or less. Um, but yes, DCIS always requires surgical therapy, usually. Um, I had a lady recently that had previous malignancies. She was found to have low-grade DCIS on a mammogram, and her margins were close. So we talked to the oncologist, and the chance of her dying from her low-grade DCIS is way lower 
than it is her other malignancy, so we did not treat it in that time, except for doing, you could consider it palliative there for DCI treatment. She was, ER, she was ERPR positive, so they're gonna treat her hormonally. Number seven, for fibroadenoma, would you get an ultrasound even though biopsy is required to confirm diagnosis or just stick with the mammogram and biopsy? Okay, so for a fibroadenoma, and you're assuming that it's a fibroadenoma, you have to get a biopsy. I traditionally don't like doing ultra, excuse me, mammograms on very young women. Someone that comes in 19, 20, 21, I don't like getting mammograms on there from the front of it. So what we will do is do an ultrasound first. If the ultrasound shows something that's consistent with a fibroadenoma, I'll do a biopsy in the office and be done with it. Now, again, that is different than what the standard is. The standard is to do a mammogram first before you do surgery. Now, realistically, we know that if you're doing a true cup biopsy on a superficial fibroadenoma, you're not going to change the architecture of the mammogram. So they're not going to normally have a BIRADS 2 and then be read out as a BIRADS 4. Um, so you're not going to make that type of change in a young woman. Um, but if you wanted to do a standard thing, once you get the mammogram, excuse me, once you get the ultrasound that shows it is something like a fibroadenoma, you then technically have to get a screening mammogram, then followed by a diagnostic mammogram, read as a BIRADS 4, then bring her back to your office, and then do the FNA. Um, I think that's a little bit overkill for a young woman Again, for me, I'd say the cutoff is probably 25. Understanding that I have had a woman with a breast cancer diagnosed at 21. So it does happen. But again, for me, and, and her, I did the same thing. Ultrasound, biopsy, biopsy came back, cancer. So we then did a mammogram and then went the routine route. But for the most part, under age women 21 and younger for me maybe 25 maybe 30 depending on how they're developed whether they've completely developed I traditionally stick with an ultrasound as a screening tool first and usually what happens is the um, ultrasound will come back as uh, by red they'll, they'll sometimes give you a BIRADS reading on an ultrasound and say hey it's BIRADS one classic fibroadenoma findings and then you have to have the discussion with the patient plus or minus their parents and come up with a plan Number eight, can you please differentiate between or confirm that fibroadenoma is the most common benign tumor, but fibrocystic disease is the most common disorder of the breast? Yeah, I think this is kind of, I think you're kind of getting caught up in stuff that really doesn't affect you clinically or the patient clinically. Realistically, all we're saying is if you take all masses that are taken out of a breast, every mass if there is a mass something that you can feel fibroadenomas are going to be the most common now if you come in and say the woman has breast pain the woman has abnormalities in her breast um, and you have an abnormality on mammogram and you're going to biopsy it and you take all of the abnormal mammograms the most common diagnosis is going to be fibrocystic disease. Hope that clarifies, guys. Good luck. Hopefully some of y'all will come rotate with me. Some of you won't. Take care.